Welcome everyone to our final Friday forum with Renaissance Society President Ken Cross, who will discuss the Renaissance Society past, present, and the vision for the future. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the web. The chat feature has been disabled for this webinar, so if you have questions, please submit them using Q&A. We have a new feature I'd like to call your attention to, which is closed captioning. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should find a button that says CC. If you click on that, that will turn on the closed captioning and you will see some other options for increasing the size of the font and so on. But let's get to today's speaker. Ken Cross graduated from West Point in 1974 with a BS in civil engineering and served as an Airborne Ranger, US Army Armor Officer for 10 years. He has held numerous diverse appointments during his successful career and was most recently elected president of the Renaissance Society Board of Directors. Ken will share the lessons learned and best practices developed in our recent challenging leap to the virtual classroom. Find out what the future holds for Renaissance and share your thoughts and ideas for the society's continuous improvement. So please join me in welcoming our Renaissance Society president, Ken Cross. Ken? Thank you, Chip. So it's really great to be here today. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us this, uh, in this fall uh, semester and is here, are here today. Um, uh, and uh, I wanna thank you uh, from my heart for uh, choosing me to be your president for the 2020, 2021 um, season. Uh, on a personal note, it's kind of interesting. I was thinking today that last January, I paused before I put my application in for the board officers. And I had to ask myself, what was going on? And what I realized was I grew up in a small town in Southern Illinois, and uh, there was a lot of farming. So people you know, would drive a tractor five miles one way and five miles back. And that was good for one trip for me, but you know, uh, looking to the future, I was kind of a change agent throughout my career. And uh, I was wondering whether Renaissance Society was willing and able to change and you know, move into the 21st century. Well, the moral of that story is to watch and be careful what you ask because we got change in steroids. And so um, with that, I would say today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what the past, the present and the vision for the future for the Renaissance Society. So I'm gonna start uh, sharing my uh, uh, slideshow for today and see if we get it up here on screen. This is not made for people with all thumbs. And there we go. So with that, uh, I'm going to take you through today. Uh, you can see our logo on uh, Learn, Connect, and Share, uh, which is the, what the uh, our Communication and Market Committee has used as a theme to in our uh, programs this year. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the acknowledge the Renaissance Society members who've helped us uh, adapt and transform or reinvent ourselves in the virtual classroom. I've really held off up to now highlighting any one individual or individuals uh, over the last eight months because it was a real team effort. But today is an opportunity to share the names and the faces of those people. Also want to share some of the lessons learned, the best practice and tips that we've uh, developed over the last eight months, and then find out what the future holds. And then lastly, share your thoughts and ideas and ask your questions. So I'm gonna move through these slides fairly quickly today. Um, so first, uh, here's a little bit of background. As far as we've started as a uh, Renaissance Society on Sac State in uh, 1986, you see on the left, Bev and Don Girth. They were instrumental. Don was the 10th Sac State president from 1984 to 2003, who helped us establish ourselves along with Bob Heilman and a group of other professors on campus. Uh, our current, we've always had a liaison and our current liaison is Dr. Diane Hyacin, who's the Dean of the uh, SSIS and also as I said, liaison. And of course now our president is Robert S. Nelson, uh, who's the 12th president of Sac State. He's actually in his sixth year right now. And so we couldn't do all this without their support as well as three unique uh, departments on a campus. Uh, the College of Continuing Education who helps us with registration. Our uh, UEI, University Enterprises uh, Incorporated who is our fiscal sponsor. And lastly, uh, IRT, our Information Resources and Technology provides all our, our support on Zoom. 
And of course, we have our Renaissance staff. And I want to point out Sherry Lowen, our office manager, and Lorraine Sarney, who's our catalog developer. Um, they not only have been working from home this year and checking in on the office periodically for voicemail and, uh, and emails, but they, <laughs> in the midst of all this this year, we got a 30 day notice and they moved our office uh, on August the 26th. Hey, but it went smoothly. And once again, it was a team effort. So I want to thank them for all the work that they've done this year. So if you went back to March the 9th of 2020 on a Monday, we had our last physical face-to-face -face board meeting. And one of our members at large, uh, Jeff Rubin, invited Dr. Glenna Trochet, who is a former Sacramento County health officer for 12 years and also a Renaissance member to come and talk to us that day. So here we were sitting in a small boardroom, shoulder to shoulder, didn't know anything about COVID and Glenna proceeded to start talking about COVID-19. I have never seen a group of people's eyes get so big and it got so silent you could hear a, literally hear a pin drop in the room. And so that day we unanimously decided that we were going to shut down operations for several weeks until everything sorted out. And ultimately, you know, the campus led the way that we were shut down on campus, not only for the rest of the spring, but the summer, the fall, and we're gonna be shut down for next spring also. So uh, from that, um, we moved forward and one of the things our former president, uh, David Abelson, did is he tasked our committee chairs to form four working groups. One was uh, uh, programs, second membership, uh, technology, and finance and administration. And so we actually had our first Zoom meeting as, as a renaissance on the, first of, uh, on the 21st of March on a Saturday. It was about an hour long. It was one of the most exciting and invigorating calls that I've had. I was just counting today, I'm up to now, Approaching 300, I think I'm at right now that I get a jill out of this, get a good time out of this. This is my 294th Renaissance uh, Society Zoom call. Uh, but this was one of the most exciting ones I've been on because we were really plotting and planning and saying, okay, what are we gonna do as we move forward for the future? Of course, one of the groups most impacted, I would say in Renaissance was our 19th Amendment uh, Centennial Celebration. Uh, they had a great program in, uh, in January, 2020. Uh, a conversation with author, uh, Dr. Joanna Newman, with over 300 people in attending. In addition, between the fall and the spring semester, there were 51 seminars and presentations that either discussed the suffragist uh, movement or issues uh, related to women. And so this was actually the first multi-year focused uh, theme in Renaissance Society's history. And so the ladies actually have a proposal they're gonna to bring to the board meeting in January to have an extension on our ad hoc committee into June so they can you know, have a few more programs uh, that got interrupted as they started this semester. One of the other things that we did was we had a group formed, a working group called the Continuous Improvement Working Group. And this was under the uh, chairmanship of, uh, chairpersonship of Minicucci. And they designed, uh, Muffy uh, Frank initially designed an all member a survey, and then Kathy and the team executed that and Kathy did the analysis on it. From that survey, we really wanted to see where we stood because nobody knew if anybody would even be willing to go on to Zoom. And so out of the survey, we had 591 responses, which is the highest we've ever had. Over 28% of our Renaissance members uh, responded. Uh, they said they were, uh, a majority said they were willing to take online classes. They realized that they needed support and they were uh, willing to take classes on days other than just Friday. And they told us the different preferred, different kind of class formats that they enjoyed. So we got a number of member in co uh, in, uh, comments. The one thing that came through loud and clear was that the members really missed social interaction and couldn't wait to get back on campus. So here's what they actually said as far as online classes. <clears throat> About two thirds, 65% said they were willing to take classes. 22% said, well, they might be willing to, they wait and see. And 13% are pretty adamant that they didn't want to participate in any kind of a virtual classroom. Where we actually ended up, interestingly enough, we, we split down the middle on the 22%. We came in at about 76 to 77 percent of our members signed up uh, that were members or new members uh, from the uh, previous year. So as we move forward with something else that was going on is we had the election of our officers was due. So we're our nominating committee and I'm not gonna read off all the names of the people you see on these slides, but I just wanna know, you know who the players were. The nominating committee's job really was to go out 
and to identify people who search for candidates, uh, collect the applications, review the applications, interview the people, and then make recommendations to the board of directors uh, on who should be members at large for the coming year, as well as the officer slate for the uh, president, sec uh, vice president, secretary, and controller. The uh, needless to say, this was all is shifted from having done all this face, about half of it was done face to face, half of it was done electronically. Next, it came to our team who was doing the actual voting, and we no longer could have a face to face annual meeting. So we went to, uh, to an electronic where we sent actually ballots out on uh, through constant contact in the form of a survey. And uh, Bob Bernadetti is our board uh, secretary, was a parliamentarian, kind of overview this process. Jeff Hen our uh, technology committee chairperson handled the electronic ballots and Sherry Lowen, our office manager handled the paper ballot tabulation. The, the board, our bylaws required if we went this route that we had to have responses from at least one third of our members, which meant we collected ballots from almost 800 people. So this was unheard of. This was something brand new for us. Once again, one, one of many new things we did this uh, over the last eight months. So one of the other groups we worked with was a catalog working group that you see here. And uh, you see the cover of our, our catalog. Uh, this was a real stretch. And we had, uh, thanks to the team leadership of Mary Ellen Burns, that you see on the left there, uh, she had the experience in the background and as a writer and an editor and having done layout work. And she connected this up with Vanessa Perez, which you see in the lower left-hand corner there on the right-hand side, uh, who is a professional graphic designer. And uh, from that, we created a, a new and improved catalog in both a flip book and a PDF version. Uh, it's colorful, uh, aesthetically pleasing, professionally laid out, uh, comp had comprehensive descriptions of our, our programs as well and services as well as our, our speaker bios. And then it, was, it really gave us a format where we could send this catalog in a PDF version to our friends and our family and associates to encourage people to come and join us. So, they really did a yeoman's task here uh, during that time frame. One of the things that happened at our board meeting on June the 6th, there were lots of, we all know in 2020, lots of turbulence in as far as racial justice issues. Um, president Nelson, our uh, president of the Sac State, uh, stepped up and took some very strong uh, opinions and views as far as committing to eradicating the disease of racism and bias in, in, on campus in our community. And so we felt compelled, the board did, to draw up this uh, diversity, equity, inclusion statement, promoting kindness and compassion uh, necessary to build inclusiveness and trust. So more, I'll speak more to that as we go forward. But in the meantime, one of the things we wanted to do was have our summer speaker series. We couldn't go to the Scottish Rite uh, uh, Temple anymore uh, over on H Street. So what we did is we went to the virtual mode and you see the list of speakers we had. This is our team that actually worked on that. Muffy Frank, Mike uh, Agron and Terry Holland. Terry is actually not a Renaissance member, but an employee of Mike's. And uh, they worked with a group of folks from Renaissance members who helped recruit our speakers that you saw, which was really a, a top of notch group. And then the production and post work of putting the, the recordings together and editing that was done by both Renaissance members and some of uh, Mike Agron's employees from his company, WebAttract. I point out one of the key figures there was a guy named Seb Franke, Frank, I'm sorry, Seb Frank, who is his grandson, 14 year old grandson, who did all the editing and he did a superb job. And uh, we just want to thank him and Ed Grunman and Terry Holland from Mike's team, as well as all those folks that put that together on for the Friday Summer Speaker Series. In addition, we had a number of Monday supper speaker series. Now, the, the Friday was open to the public. What we were really trying to do is recruiting. We had si we had more people sign up. Typically in the summer, we'd have at the Scottish Rite two to 250 people. We had over 13, close to 1,400 people who had individually unduplicated members who signed up for that Friday series. And that we were really using is to educate our members on Zoom and also for recruiting purposes. On the Monday speaker series, we had our own internal seminar leaders, six of them uh, in July and August that presented. And Sarah Ryan Roberts and Jeff Hindi and Mary and Kyle managed that program. We were trying to once again, train our, our internal members only uh, on Zoom, as well as uh, help our seminar leaders adjust to the new uh, venue. 
And from that, we created a series, the Summer Series Portal, which is all still up today. If you look on the our website, and this is great for recruiting purposes. If you want to send your your, your friends who have thought about coming to the Renaissance, uh, those uh, the link to that uh, on the website. It really shows the quality and class of our uh, presentations. So out of that came a Zoom tech team, and these folks are the the ones who actually started to do all the training for our seminal leaders and our technical hosts. So between Sarah, Jeff, Marion, and Mike, uh, they did Zoom training, they did technical host surveys, uh, we did the online learning resources on the website that you could tap into. Uh, Sarah created a Zoom tips and techniques Friday weekly message uh, out to the technical hosts. We had drop-in training that between Sarah and Marion and Mike that they conducted and been conducting called the thugs i got a little worried when i first heard this but they actually stand for the technical host users group monday meetings and so the thugs would meet on monday amongst themselves amongst technical hosts and share some of the things they've been learn learning so um this was so good our training was so good we actually had a request from ollie at uc davis if they could sit in on our training and also use our materials and we said sure just as long, I, I told them, I said, as long as you, and they, they agreed, the team agreed, as long as you give credit to our team, you know, for all the work they've done, but we shared that with others. Now, I really have thought about this for the last couple of months of how I was gonna recognize all the program leaders and technical hosts. There's not enough room. <laughs> you figure we had 125 programs, seminars, presentations, and SIGs, which stands for shared interest groups, those leaders, 125 of them, plus another 80 plus technical hosts. And together, this 200 plus people are the backbone of our lifelong learning program. This is really a team effort with equally important roles. So their photos won't fit on the page here if I put them all on, if I could even gather them all, I, I don't know if I could do that, but I just want them to know that this whole program would have been for naught if we hadn't had people that took the risk, men and women who took the risk and said, okay, I'll try this Zoom thing. And then we put out a survey, actually Jeff Hindy did, looking for technical hosts. We had over 90 people who actually replied to that survey and said, well, I'll give this a try. So the, one of the couple of groups that were really mostly affected also not being with the COVID going on and the pandemic going on uh, with the Membership Diversity and Community Engagement Committee. Uh, as you see, by virtue of what the committee does, a lot of it's out in the community, out face to face. Now, these are all pre-COVID-19 photos, but you can see up in the on the left-hand side there, uh, uh, pictures and outside uh, from the <clears throat> MLK 365 uh, uh, Walk for the Dream, which was uh, started and walked to community, started down at uh, Sac City College. In the middle, you see the picture and the people in the formal attire that was at the Martin Luther King celebration in January. On the right-hand side, you see a bunch of people around the table. Those are people, uh, some of our members that were putting together packets, member packets last fall in 2019 semester. Lower right-hand corner is our new members uh, uh, dinner that we uh, do uh, each semester. And in the middle down below is from the, sex, uh, the actual, the Sacramento uh, Black uh, Book Festival. Uh, last summer. Needless to say, all those events for this year have been canceled, uh, but our members uh, continue to do their part. In addition, we have our, our ambassadors, and you can see uh, in this picture, once again, they've kind of gotten shut down because they can't go out face to face, but on the left-hand side, you see us uh, at a table, staffing a table uh, at the Eschaton Walk This Way uh, quarterly program they have. The, the women in the yellow vests are, are, were our tour guides at our last uh, Renaissance Society um, orientation rendezvous. They took the people out on campus tours. And then the two pictures on the left in the center and the bottom of the slide <clears throat> is the first training session we had in February 2019 for the ambassadors. And so these are the folks that go out and ta have tabling events and speaking events to be able to spread the word about the Renaissance Society. So the educational working group, now what do they do? Well, this was a group of people who got together. Uh, the majority of those folks of all, as you see here, uh, have spent time as educators, professional educators at elementary, high school, community college and university level. And so we were looking for a way we could do a virtual seminar leaders workshop 
that really talk to the technical teaching skills uh, that we wanted to share with our members and how to use Zoom most effectively. And so we did that in uh, August on the 7th and the 21st on a Friday. We actually had two sessions uh, <clears throat> compared to in the past, it's only been one morning session. And I just wanna thank, they did a great job uh, really of bringing us into the virtual classroom for this fall. And these are all the folks on the program committee. And these are the folks that, uh, you know, semester in, semester out, that go out, uh, co-chaired by uh, Cindy Zaconic and Alan Keon. And these are the folks who look for our seminar leaders and our presenters and our uh, shared interest groups and work together to find those and to mentor and to coach uh, those programs to bring them to fruition each semester. One of the other things we had this year was our virtual orientation and rendezvous, which traditionally had been held at the ballrooms at the University Union. Couldn't do that this year. So what we did is did a 90 minute virtual orientation broken in into three 30 minute sections. The first was a member, member orientation, followed by the moderated uh, rendezvous panel where we answered questions for both new and existing members. And then the last 30 minutes was presentations by volunteer organizations looking for our members to help them and, and uh, serve uh, on the campus and the community. Uh, we had over 175 people uh, turn out and it was not only just new members, but existing members. And it was a really great program, uh, lot, uh, numerous really positive responses back from, from all our members. And then a forum committee, of course, they had to, you know, here we were going, we'd always been on the, either in Del Norte 1004 or uh, we've been over at the University Union, neither of those facilities were open this time. So this team was responsible for going out and recruiting these speakers. And the, the lineup for the speakers this fall was the best that I've seen in the two years I've been on the committee. Um, they not only recruit them, they market them, and <clears throat> they do this coaching. And one of the arms of this, Chris Smith and our group of technical hosts had to coach the speakers each week. They got together one or, or twice with the speakers ahead of time me included, to coach us and make sure we were ready to present. And then we have our communications and marketing committee. And uh, this is under the chairpersonship of Deborah Seiler. And uh, this uh, committee has really stepped up this year. Uh, these are the folks that you manage all our platforms from the, uh, the recorded newsletter to our uh, website and our uh, uh, weekly updates that we do via constant contact. And then this year we added the Facebook page. Right now we have one person shy. We have 499 Facebook members. We just started in spring with Facebook. So really populated quickly. The other big thing that they put out is the annual report. And I just want to give an acknowledgement to Deborah Seiler and Nancy Finn Dyson and to David Abelson who put our annual report together. Uh, we printed that you can find that. I encourage you, if you haven't read that, please do uh, look online on our website under the board and governance page, and you'll find under the documents, you'll find the annual report. It's in a PDF, you can pop that up and take a look at it. Really nicely done, lots of great pictures in there, and uh, tells you about what we have done both on and off campus. We're in the process right now of distributing that to our partners, both on and off campus and the senior leadership at Sac State. So once again, a great annual report, uh, and thank you to all the members of the Communications and Marketing Committee. Resource Development Committee. This is a relatively new committee, just a savage in the last two years under the chairpersonship of Nancy Finn Dyson. Uh, you can see one of the things we're trying to do is to be able to raise more funds on, from our members for campus activities. You can see that we raised over $31,000 for the ASI Food Pantry. Additionally, we, we uh, uh, awarded $21,000 in student scholarships raised uh, uh, donations over $10,000 for the 19th Amendment events. And then we had uh, for the music program donated $4,500 as well as uh, $2,400 to Sac State Cares and another $2,000 for member scholarships that we now offer for our members who may be financially challenged. So uh, with that, I would point out that, uh, um, you know, th this is a we, one of the additions is not shown on that it happened this fall registration. We had a voluntary donation program. And this had been a dream of Alan Cohen, you know, Keon's for several uh, years. And we actually had 222 people, members who donated over $10,425 to 
the organization to help do good works and to be able to continue to improve our programs. So just want to thank all of you who donated to whatever program. This is like a smorgasbord laid out. You can donate. It's donor centric where you want to donate your money. I'm going to pause for a drink of water here. Okay. And then that shows you the same, really be the same numbers, but just in the graphic form, maybe a little easier to read where those funds uh, went this year. And we're actually in the process right now of sending solicitation letters out for our scholarship fund. So you should be receiving those in the next week or two. So I ask you for an end of year gift to consider donating to help our Sac State students. And here it is, our scholarship committee. You see the, in, the, in the top center there, the uh, 2019 recipients of our scholarships, uh, seven of them and all the members who work on this. And so our scholarship committee, the, the, the call is sent out by the university, the students, right? the applications come back to us. Our committee goes over them in great detail. Uh, they send back the recommendation to the university. And then <clears throat> in the past, what we have done is held a, uh, um, a, an hour annual meeting at the uh, uh, one of the ho local hotels and then uh, in, had our annual meeting and our scholarship awards. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that this spring. We're going to try to do it virtually next uh, semester. So here shows you a picture of the scholarship recipients for this spring 2020 and their names there. Uh, and once again, we not only eroded, we awarded th seven scholarships of $3,000 each for a total of $21,000, but we hit a milestone. This is our 27th year. We'd award our 100th scholarship for a total of $206,000 in scholarships to Sac State students over the last 27 years. So I just want to thank the uh, Scholars Committee for all their hard work uh, in this hitting that milestone this year. Finance and Administration Committee. I, we've always had a controller, one of our board officers, but a couple of years ago we established the Finance and Administration Committee. And their job is really to help uh, design our budget uh, through working with committee chairs and monitor that budget throughout the year. Lincoln's to say there were some concerns this year. You know, we didn't know how many people would show up. So our controller, uh, Norv Wellsfree, uh, spent a good deal of time modeling and looking at what the numbers will work out to be uh, and what it would take to be able to balance our budget. He's written a couple of good articles this year. Basically, our fixed costs are pretty much, uh, as you'll see here, uh, you see what our revenue, what our expenses were. We did come up with some surplus uh, at the end of last year. Uh, that was because some of our events that weren't held on a campus physically face to face that we didn't expend those funds when it was shut down. And then on the right, you see where the money actually goes as far as office operations, program expenses, uh, CSU services, CSUS services, and operating surplus. So the good news, we're in solid shape uh, and they're doing a great job of monitoring both our uh, revenues and our expenses. And one of the things to always be aware of is we're a membership driven organization. So we're not a 501c3. We looked at that a few years ago and, and there were complications and we couldn't follow through. So our revenues come almost solely from, from, uh, fund, from our membership dues. So it's, um, that's what helps drive the train to make this all work. So one of the things we talked before about was our diversity, equity, and inclusion statement that we had this year. And our commitment was to do two things as we look forward under a paper that was prepared uh, by a working group uh, called Sacramento Communities. And we said one of the things we wanted to work on was increasing our curriculum of uh, classes and forums that were about uh, work looking at diverse groups and subjects uh, from ethnicity and all kinds of standpoints. The other thing we want to do is continue to work on increasing our membership. Uh, so here I would just point out to you in the spring, these are the five of the forms. I'm not going to read them to you, but you can see the diversity of the topics that will be uh, be presented this spring. And leading off with Tom, uh, mainly Tom, breaking through the glass ceilings of the California State Legislature. Uh, she was kind of a first. She wrote a book recently. That's uh, the title. Uh, she's going to be interviewed by Barbara O'Connor on our first forum on the 12th of February, where she really is the first Asian and woman, uh, Asian woman in the uh, legislature are working, you know, in the Capitol there to be able to move things forward. So I encourage you to attend those forums. I think we're working hard to try to make sure 
we're rep representing diversity. And additionally, you see eight actual uh, seminars or um, presentation or um, shared interest groups that will be offered in the spring semester and will be in our catalog. So I think there's several of those in there I would like, I personally want to take. Uh, I think they'll be very informative. So we're gonna work hard on finding more uh, curriculum and more membership. So some of the results of our transformation and innovation results, uh, we actually ended up with 1,500, 1,577 members. Uh, of those 252 were new members and 1,325 were renewing members. So we were about at 76, 77% of where we were this time last year when we closed the, uh, the membership uh, window. Of those 80 are honorary members uh, who are 90 years of age or older. So if you're a dedicated lifelong learner, what's the, the brass ring is you get a free membership when you're 90 years or older. As I mentioned before, we had 125 seminars and over 14,000 enrollments. That's close, I think, an average of eight, nine uh, enrollments per, per um, member. We also, we no longer had you know, barriers. So we had people from out of state, from uh, not only the state of California, but Maine, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, and Washington State. So some of the lessons that we've learned uh, over this time. Um, you know, one of the first things we had been toying with for some time is there's a can be a tendency you get into committee work and you don't cross coordinate between each other. This process this year really broke down the silos where we had working groups from across committees working across boundaries. Uh, one of the things we were really dedicated to this year as we will move to the virtual classroom was doing continuous improvement and really innovation was unleashed. We made a pivot and starting in the Sac State, they have this uh, phrase they use about building the airplane as we took off. We really didn't have all the answers sometimes as we moved forward, but we knew that we would keep an open mind and try to avoid reinventing the wheel and look for new ideas and best practices from our peers. What I discovered was we have an incredibly talented, experienced uh, groups of, of Renaissance members. I sit here, over 200 people stepped up to volunteer and serve. After I compiled the slideshow, I'd say it's closer to over 300 people because we have almost 200, you can see, uh, just between seminar leaders and, and our uh, technical hosts. So there's easily 300 or more. Um, the other thing I think was in order to receive, you have to ask. And I think the classic example was uh, Jeff Hindi is our tech uh, committee uh, chairperson sent out a two question uh, survey uh, that basically said, would you like to be a technical host and described what it was, yes or no. And we had over 90 responses from our members. One of the other things, and that's something I kind of harped on with people is you learn don't procrastinate, make decisions quickly. So I would always tell people, I said, hey, you can't pause and have a committee meeting and get around all these things. You work in groups, you got to make decisions and move on because every one of those decisions you make, there'll be another five or 10 questions right behind them. So we got to move fast, rapidly. So it really was a deployment on multiple levels going on simultaneously. And we were working hard to coordinate between each other to make sure nobody got too far out left or right or too far in front. Uh, one of the other brilliant ideas that came up, and I want to give credit to Bob Benedetti, our board secretary, who's a member of the Finance and Ad Committee meeting, is we are having one of these meetings, he said, you know, really ought to have an innovation fund so we don't have to slow things down and allocate some money. So we went to the board, they allocated $20,000 from that. Uh, when we started doing the new improved flipbook and PDF catalogs, uh, we hired uh, an a independent contractor, uh, Vanessa Perez, who's a graphic designer. Uh, right now, we actually have some 60-second lectures uh, that are being uh, uh, coached by uh, an independent contractor with Kelsey Mayer. Um, basically, what these are are going to be, and we're going to have them for the spring semester, it's like a, uh, uh, an elevator speech, where in about 60 seconds, a you know, seminar leader can describe what their program's all about and sell the sizzle of it. You know? And so she's actually, I have my interview tomorrow. She's going to be coaching me on that. And we hope to have those posted with links in our catalog so that you can actually, just like if you went to a rendezvous and you showed up and you went to the table and you asked them, well, what's your seminar about? They give you a 30 to 60 second little pitch as far as what their program's all about. 
That's what we're doing with that. So we're continuing to look to use those funds uh, if proposals will come forward for the innovation fund. One of the other key things that happened was we really front end loaded our Zoom training. And I think this was absolutely brilliant on, and, on the people who came up with this idea. On those Friday, Friday and Monday summer speaker series and, and Zoom tutorials and training sessions quickly raised the, the learning curve and the knowledge level of all our members significantly over the summer. So in the fall, we were working with simply the people who hadn't participated in the summer. So it really, it, it, uh, it got us up and moving into the virtual community much quicker. I, I would be wrong if I didn't acknowledge the state, uh, Sac State support. Uh, information versus technology, I in the college community, uh, education, continuing education, CCE <clears throat> in the uh, uh, UEI helped us Oh, just over the top this year. They had their own plates full, needless to say, with serving 31,000 students this year, but they, they stepped up the plate and helped us. One of the things we try to do is capture our institutional memory as we develop these new practices and procedures and put those into part of our uh, working uh, process. And then once again, the other thing is we talked about is sharing our knowledge. You know, Ollie at UC Davis came to us and said, hey, uh, we've seen your material. It really looks great. Um, I said, would you like to use it? Would you like to go to the training? They said, sure. So they came in and participated in our training and we're very, very appreciative of that. And we've also had approaches from other groups. So with that, <laughs> I, I know the board members are laughing right now because this is one a book that I picked up about, about 12, I think it was maybe as far as back, maybe 15 years ago when I worked at Habitat for Humanity. Um, I came across this uh, monogram called Good to Great in Social Sectors. It's by uh, uh, Jim Collins. He wrote a business professor out of Stanford who'd written a number of business books, but he kept getting the question, you know, from nonprofits and social sector organizations said, okay, I understand when the profit's involved, but what about when there's not profit involved? how do you use these standards of being great? And so he created this little 35 page monogram. I, it's one of the best books I've read in the last 20 years, uh, really talking about how like us as a, as a, we're not a nonprofit, it's a social group, uh, educational group, how we can improve ourselves. My point is what you would, if you read this monogram, what you have seen we've been doing over the last mo eight months is what he talks about in the book. So. So the spring semester, uh, this was an announcement that uh, President Robert Nelson made on September 10th, 2020. I'm not gonna read it to you, uh, but basically he announced that we will be uh, once again in spring 2021, uh, will be another virtual semester. I highlighted in yellow here, I think the most key thing is health and safety continue to be our top priority. And while the decision will not be popular with everyone, I believe it is the right choice to keep your campus and our community safe. And I can tell you the board has addressed this on several occasions, both in March and recently in our last, one of our last board meetings that uh, we're all adults and we can make decisions. But from the standpoint, uh, we, we want to uh, follow a policy that protects our members. And so we're gonna take, follow, continue to follow Sac State's lead uh, as we move forward uh, with uh, the virtual classrooms. So some of the advantages of the virtual uh, Zoom classroom. One of the things we found that <clears throat> members really liked was the fact that we not only, we, not, we offered programs Monday through Friday so they could take more classes. As you can see, enrollments went up to over 14,000 uh, this semester. <clears throat> One of the great things, no geographical bar barriers, don't matter where you live, in California, in the United States, overseas. You know, if you've got a computer and a camera and a mic, uh, you can connect up. We're no longer limited, uh, <clears throat> limited by classroom size or availability. You know, uh, that's been challenging in recent years as we've grown. Uh, you don't have to commute to campus and, ru and do rush hour traffic. You know, there are some people um, that never came to the forum. Why? Because um, they had rush hour traffic. You didn't want to have to fight through that. Um, so, and then unlimited parking. <laughs> uh, as much parking as you have outside your house and seats in your home, right? Uh, and then uh, it's improving accessibility. This is one of the comments. People who have hearing, uh, mobility issues, even uh, sight issues, 
uh, that Zoom gives much more flexibility. Uh, as you see today, there's this captioning that just came online. It's a new feature on Zoom. It's really accurate, very quick, and very, uh, let's say, very accurate. And then the other thing that people really like this year, our members have liked, is Zoom recordings. They can be archived, uh, and they have transcribed uh, audio. Uh, so if you have a time uh, conflict, an appointment, a doctor's appointment, uh, and you couldn't make it to class, you could still uh, follow the recordings. So where are we going forward in the in future in 2021? And the question I've been asked more times than anything else is, when will students return to Zach State? Well, it's a two-parter. And we really don't know. Um, we know that we'll be virtual in the spring. Uh, I anticipate sometime in May, they'll have to make the decision for next fall uh, because they have to have lead time. This year, they meet at the middle of, I think, the, the 12th of May or something like that. It was just this... Uh, this year. Um, and then the other question is follow on, will Renaissance Society go back to programs one day per week on Fridays on the Sac State's campus? Once again, we do not know that. Um, it all comes down to physical classroom allocation and that's controlled by Sac State Space Management who's been very good to us over the years. Um, but the reality is first priority is gonna to go to Sac State students as it should be. You know, because they're the students and their parents are paying for their education and public funds are being spent to support the CSU system. So they have first priority. What we do know is that our members really miss the opportunity for social interaction and meeting face to face. So they want to get back on campus. Um, we members do want to have the uh, opportunity to take more seminars. Um, you know, in the past, people would have a long list of seminars they wanted to take. They could have one in the morning on Friday, one in the afternoon, maybe something at lunchtime. Um, but I, you know, I think there's both from members who attend classes as well as seminar leaders that I that are have grown to like Zoom. They still want the social interaction, but I think what we're looking at is some combination of physical classrooms and virtual classrooms that gives members more options and choice. As I mentioned earlier, the forum attendance is higher than it's ever been in the past. Um, because, you know, people that couldn't attend in the, because of commuting or rush hour traffic don't have those impediments anymore. So the best guess that I can tell you right now is that we're looking at some kind of hybrid program um, for members, students, and seminar leaders are really increasingly interested in continuing to have both. So you have options to choose whether you come on campus on Friday, Monday through Thursday on Zoom, or do both. Uh, so that's going to be one of our, as we come back to a physical classroom, we're going to have to sort out that whole process. Um, one thing I don't have in this slide uh, that just came up in discussions this week was one of the things that, um, that I'm kind of excited about doing is uh, cranking up our long range strategic planning uh, group once again. Uh, and it's now an ad hoc committee that uh, or a working group. Um, and to take a look at this, this hybrid approach and how we're going to, what Renaissance Society will look like in the future. Uh, just know that there are over 400 lifelong learning organizations nationwide. Um, what I'm gonna, I have in my mind right now is a form of working group from our, each of our committees that have a vested interest in this, to take a look at the top five to 10% of those organizations. Um, I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel. You know, and making that you know, if somebody's got a good idea, you know, give them credit, polish it up a little bit, and adapt it to your own uh, setting. So, what I'd like to do is look at the, the the best lessons learned, best practices, tips from other organizations, and focus in out of that 400 the ones that are similar similar to us. Uh, organizations, lifelong learning organizations, have a uh, a, a similar size to us. Uh, have a strong virtual presence now as we have, uh, that have strong support from their hosts, who their university or college or whoever supports them. And so from that, I think it could distill down just as we did this same thing on the catalog. Uh, one of our uh, program committee uh, chairpersons, uh, um, Cindy Sconic, took a look at the catalogs of the ones in the state of California, the 38 other lifelong learning organizations and came up with some of the best features and we incorporated that into our uh, catalog, our, uh, our flip book and PDF catalog. So with that, 
some key dates to remember for uh, spring of 2021, you see where our mid-year membership uh, registration portal with CCE will open up on the Tuesday, the 5th of January. Our registration portal will open up where you can register for programs on Monday and January 11th. We once again will have a virtual orientation rendezvous from 10 to 11.30 on Friday, the 15th of January. And then our seminars and programs will actually start the week of Monday, the 8th of February. Some ways that you can engage in the Renaissance Society. You see here the picture of Susan George. Susan is a member at large with the uh, um, Renaissance Society. Uh, and she, on her board of directors, she volunteered to uh, run the uh, nom nominating committee uh, this year. Uh, she, along with uh, Barbara Davis Lyman, our vice uh, president, and uh, Warren Bonta, uh, have agreed to uh, look for members. And so if you're interested or want to know more, we'll be sending out information and uh, you can contact Susan. There's her email and her phone number uh, to be able to know how you can get engaged and involved. Uh, well, the second thing there is donating to the Sac State uh, Student Scholarship Fund. Uh, you'll find that on our website. Uh, as I say, we're in the donating mode right now. We need to raise that money, the $21,000 for this year's scholarships. Of course, and then the next thing is inviting your friends, your family, your acquaintances to join Renaissance Society, no matter where they live, either national or international. I know there's some folks right now that have family overseas and they're gonna invite them to join. In fact, some of them are actually giving them the gift of membership. You know, the mid-year memberships are only $60. So um, something to consider. There are probably somebody that you have that you really care about that you would like to give them the opportunity. I know my sister, my brother-in-law, I gave them a membership uh, this year and they're really enjoying uh, the programs. Uh, so uh, think about that as a possibility. And then last, volunteer with our Renaissance Society committees. Uh, if you look on the uh, board and governance page on our website, and there's a link that's shown there, then you can actually um, uh, give descriptions of each one of those committees and how you can get involved. So with that, um, I'm, I'm, fortunately, I've not gotten hoarse yet. Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn it over now to question and answers. And uh, I know Christy Brazil is on and she's gonna handle those questions. So if you have, put them in the chat room. Christy. Well, thank you, Ken. That was one heck of a comprehensive report. That's for sure. In fact, it was I think it was so thorough that we don't have any questions <laughs> uh, in particular, but they may come in as you and I just chat here a bit. I'd like to just acknowledge, Ken, that I think your stellar leadership over this last year has, has really been significant for all of us to be able to continue to be motivated and be agile and, and do the pivoting that you talked about um, doing. And it's it's made me very proud to be participating in a lot of these um, different planning groups and, and uh, organizing functions that uh, we have such a, a great group of, of professional and dedicated and, and passionate people that have made Renaissance so much more successful than I think it, it might have been otherwise given these challenging times, but kudos to you. I mean, you have over almost, would you say, 300 Zoom meetings you've <laughs> hung out at? <laughs> Goodness gracious, I don't think there was a single committee meeting that I was on that you weren't just kind of taking copious notes in the background and and not necessarily offering a, a whole bunch of input, but you were definitely in attendance and participating and, and I think that energy has has wafted over to all of us. So thank you so much for all of that. I'm going to ask you a question that I know gets asked a lot of us on the board um, and you kind of covered it, but people have a tendency to say, how come you can't reduce the price of Renaissance since we're not meeting on campus anymore? And that seems to be something we just need to continue to re-educate people about. Can you talk about that for a bit? Yeah, I, thank you for asking that because I, that's, a, that's a common question I get. And I know when we shut down in the spring, there were people that said, well, we only got 40% of our classes. Can we get a rebate? And we just didn't make a decision. North, uh, well, uh, Wellstreet, who was our incoming controller, ran the numbers in great detail and um, and started projecting what our membership was going to be. And he wrote a couple of really great articles that have been in the recorder newsletter describing our budget. Cause that's one of the problems that most people, I, me included until I became a member at large and said in board meetings, I didn't appreciate how the budget worked. 
And the reality is when we open the doors, kind of money comes in and money goes out. It doesn't matter how many members there are. There's a lot of fixed costs we have. Um, it's everything from, uh, you know, we have small two part-time staff. We actually let someone go this year. We were hated to do that a long time employee, but we were anticipating the challenge of uh, reduced membership. But then we also have, we pay for um, our registration with CCE. We have um, uh, fixed cost of, of, uh, of uh, the support with the computer system from IRT. So all these things costs are pretty much fixed costs that just to open our doors, we have to pay. So we've made a, the board looked at this, the finance and admin committee recommended said, we're not, we can't afford to do rebates. There's too many unknowns. Um, what it did allow us to do, I think along the way is also have this innovation fund to be able to do the pivot, right? And make the changes. And so, um, our commitment was we didn't want to get in a position where we had to increase membership dues. And so we really tightened up on our, our budget. Uh, we looked for every penny. And, you know, fortunately, the number that Norm Wellsbury came up with as our controller was, he said, we need to get over 1,500 members. And so I, I took that on as far as being the membership chair. <laughs> I knew the monkey was on my back in our committee, our membership diversity and community engagement committee. So um, uh, once again, I, I, the thing I go back to and, and people, when I show them, when you have 125 programs and you can enroll as many as you want, for $100, this is a real bargain. I mean, I, I have gone out and I have looked at the websites of other organizations like the I Share Lifelong Learning throughout the state of California. Um, there's about 125 of those nationwide. I'm going on a little while. I know I am. I'm telling you how the, the watch is made here. But in those programs, you not only pay your membership, but you pay for each one of the classes you enroll in. And so invariably, when I add up the numbers, they're higher in other organizations. The membership dues might be lower. But when you start, the more classes you start taking, easily you surpass $100 very, very quickly. So bottom line is, it's a real bargain. And I think we're very, very fiscally tight as far as how we spend our money. Uh, try to get a buck out of, out of Nor Wells Free. Uh, he carries on the tradition of Jack Jennings as far as being tight as a tick with his wallet. You know, the, the maws will come out of his wallet. I'm, I'm convinced. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Thanks. A couple of people have asked, we've got a lot more questions now. A couple of people have asked, when is the spring catalog going to come out? Our goal is to get it out. Well, okay. The, the members the seminar registration opens up on Monday on the 11th of January. Our goal is to get it out before then and the earlier we can. And so the, our graphic designer and our team, the catalog team working group knows that. So we're looking probably um, within the first week, the 10 days of January, it'll be out. Classes start on the 8th of February. So, you know, it'll be out a month before our classes start. Pretty quickly. Great. Okay. Um, somebody's asked, what does Ollie stand for at UC Davis? Um, oh, okay. So Usher Lifelong Learning uh, Institute, O-L-L-I, uh, there are about 125 of them uh, nationwide. So, Mm, a little less, maybe 30% of the ones that are in that 400 nationwide are from this group. Uh, a philanthropist out of uh, uh, San Francisco, I can't remember his first name, but his, uh, uh, his last name is Osher. Out of his foundation, he wealthy guy, he helped establish these, um, these programs. Uh, the difference in Ollie, uh, the, the primary difference between us and Ollie is Ollie primarily uses professors, retired or active duty professors uh, to be able to teach their classes. We were offered some years ago the opportunity to be, become Ollie. It was kind of tempting. There <laughs> grants of a million dollars, you know. Uh, but our membership and our leadership at the time felt very strongly that we wanted to continue with our peer-to-peer -peer learning process. In other words, where our members teach each other and uh, take classes and teach classes. And so they didn't want to go down. They didn't want to chase the money. They wanted to keep it as we are. So we're unique um, amongst those lifelong learning organizations, I think, in, in our peer-to-peer -peer mode. So. Okay, great. Uh, 
somebody is asking um, if you, if the reason the silos were broken down is because you're on most of the committees. I'm sorry. <laughs> somebody is wondering if the reason that the silos broke down were broken down uh, is that because you're a member of most of the committees. I'm I'm an ex officio member of uh, all the committee, so you know that's part of my job is and. And as you commented, I normally sit in those meetings and don't say a whole lot. It's not my job. To, I don't lead the committees. I'm basically there as a listener, and I see myself as the glue to be able to carry information from committee to committee if I don't hear it coming up so that we, we're working together. Um, so to answer your question as far as why the silos came down, I think we saw that we needed to have members from various committees working together in order to see that bigger picture. And um, uh, so it couldn't just be me, but it had to be other members. And so we, we formed these working groups where it's typically maybe several members from several different committees working together, the people with the most knowledge on those topics. So, yeah. Someone's asked if we have any sense of, of the members that we lost since last year. Um, did we do an analysis of that? And I know you, you can address that. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> we typically um, will lose about 20 to 25 percent of our members each year. And we've surveyed that. We actually did a survey last year, and I don't have all that data on the top of my head, but I would say there are always various reasons. Um, people, people, are engaged and they get involved in other things. People move out of the Sacramento area or out of state. Uh, people have health issues or their partner or loved one or spouse has health issues. I mean, all the things you could think of come up. Um, so like, we would lose about 20 to 25% of our membership each year. One of the things we did this year was um, working with Nora, we put together a list of the people who had not they call it re-enlisted, who had not uh, uh, renewed over the last five years, over 1,900 people. And we sent them out a spatial email just to let them know what we were doing, you know, with the catalog and all these other things. And we picked up people uh, from that, uh, from those messages. So, uh, and we also picked up people who had moved out of state. I know I just finished a seminar on Wednesday. I had a, a, a physician who had been a Renaissance member who was living in Portland, Oregon. I had another woman who was in uh, Texas, someplace outside of Austin. You know, now they had, they could be, I have a friend, uh, Bill Fackenthal, who moved to Maine a couple of years ago. He rejoined. So you have people in these other states now, just because they moved out of state, they can still join us virtually on Zoom. Okay. Um, someone's asking about the slide that you had all the spring semester dates on. Is, is something like that available on the website that people can refer to? Sure, we just talked about that this morning in an email. Uh, Shari Lowen sent it out. I know at the end here that um, uh, Chip Zimple is going to put it up the slide again, I think, at the end. But we also have it coming out in the uh, newsletter, in uh, uh, both the December newsletter. It's in there on posted on the website. And we're also going to be posting it to the website and sending out all our other media communications uh, vehicles, platforms. OK. Great. We've got just a, another minute or so. Somebody's asking if we have any single page ads or flyers they could hand out to family or friends about uh, Renaissance and get them excited. You know, that's a really good idea. Uh, we have had one in the past. We probably need to redo one. I, what I do personally is I send people emails and I just peel off the links. Rather than, rather than just sending the website, I'll peel out the link for the catalog and the website and two or three things. So all they do is click on it and bam, they're there. You know, If they look at that catalog, unless they don't wanna do lifelong learning, they're sold. It's funny. And then the next question is, well, how do I join? And I send them the link on how to join. So um, so I try to direct people to the website, but like the scalpel, right? Rather than just find it for yourself, here it is, right? So that's what I recommend. That's what Push I- Push it out to them, yeah, good idea. Yeah. Well, I think that's that's about a wrap for our time, Ken. Thank you so much, and a and a good end to our semester as well. Very good. And if people have questions anytime, my email and my phone number is on the website. You're welcome to contact me anytime. Appreciate you having me today. Thanks, Ken, for a, a great uh, great discussion, and thank you also for all the incredible work you've done, all of your selfless time you put in. 
um, I can't imagine uh, saying, oh, okay, yeah, I'll be, I'll be president and then getting slammed with all the changes that have happened. Um, I'd like to remind people that this presentation has been recorded and it will be available on the Renaissance Society forums channel on YouTube. Uh, next semester, our first forum will be February 12th, as Ken said, with Asian American author, mother and politician, Maylee Tom, speaking about breaking through the glass ceilings in the California legislature. And here once again is the schedule that Ken put up earlier of the important dates for spring. And we hope you all will have a happy, safe and healthy holiday. And we look forward to seeing you in 2021.